This is Dr. Hessel dictating the podcast for the new residents on neuromuscular blockade, blocking and reversal agents. Uh, your reading assignment you're aware of. Uh, these are the items that I'm going to try to cover. This is really a supplement to the interactive session that Dr. Eshelman held with you last week. Uh, first, I want to talk about the physiology and pharmacology of the neuromuscular junction. Uh, anatomically, it consists of a prejunctional nerve ending, uh, the synaptic cleft, and the postsynaptic membrane. And uh, the acetylcholine uh, receptors, which are uh, presynaptic, postsynaptic, and extra junctional. There's a typographical error here. It should be uh, acetylcholine receptors, not acetylcholinesterase receptors. Uh, normal activation and depolarization uh, occurs as follows. Uh, acetylcholine is produced and stored in packets at the end of the motor nerve where it attaches to the muscle fiber. When the motor nerve impulses arrive, it causes release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine then binds to the postsynaptic nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. This causes depolarization of the muscle membrane, resulting in muscle contraction, which then is propagated along the muscle membrane. The acetylcholine is then rapidly, within a few milliseconds, uh, uh, by tissue acetylcholinesterase, which is also located in the membrane and therefore the muscle recovers. It is important to know that various illnesses can affect this system. Denervation, such as spinal cord injury, chronic and critical illness, immobility, perhaps major trauma and extensive burns after about 24 to 72 hours, may lead to alteration of the acetylcholine receptors on the muscle. They become changed to the immature type, and also they multiply in extrajunctional sites. This has two important consequences. It becomes, they become more sensitive to succinylcholine and result in the release of much more potassium. And secondly, they are more resistant to non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. These effects may last for three to six months following this type of illness. Before we proceed, I want to give you my opinions about principles of use of neuromuscular blocking agents. First of all, neuromuscular blocking agents should only be used if they are required to assist with intubation or required to facilitate surgical exposure and the procedure. Often, they are not necessary for either of these indications. Furthermore, neuromuscular blockade should not be used to prevent movement if this is because of inadequate anesthesia or analgesia. And secondly, it shouldn't be used to suppress respiratory efforts on the part of the patients. These should be treated by appropriate dosing of the anesthetic. Thirdly, if neuromuscular blocking agents are required, neuromuscular monitoring should be initiated before and during administration and during reversal. Secondly, you should use the lowest possible doses of agents guided by such monitoring. 
Finally, the pharmacokinetic dynamics vary widely between agents and patients, and thus they must be monitored with monitors, and recovery mo profile is even more variable from agent to agent and in patient to patient. Let's thus then turn to neuromuscular blocking agents. There are two classes, the non-depolarizing, for which we have only one agent, and the non-depolarizing agents, which we'll discuss later. Both only exert their effects on the neuromuscular junction. between the motor nerves and thus neither directly affect the skeletal muscle itself. The skeletal muscle will still react to direct stimulation such as by electrocautery. And finally, neither affect smooth muscles or cardiac muscles. Another preliminary state is that muscle sensitivity to neuromuscular blockade varies greatly. This explains why one can be misled when monitoring at different peripheral sites, such as the face or the hand or the leg. Oropharyngeal muscles are very sensitive. This favors intubation and dealing with laryngoscope but it renders patients at risk for, less, for loss of airway, aspiration, and respiratory complications, even with very low concentrations of neuromuscular blockade. On the other hand, the diaphragm is very resistant. This is protective. But on the other hand, it is why monitoring ventilation parameters and the presence of breathing are not reliable clues to full recovery. Now let's concentrate on the class of depolarizing muscle relaxants. And the only agent in this category is succinylcholine, which was introduced in 1952. It mimics acetylcholine. It causes fasciculation of the muscle, but the muscle doesn't recover immediately because unlike true choline, acetylcholine, it is not hydrolyzed by tissue acetylcholinesterase. Therefore, it remains attached to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and blocks further neuromuscular stimulation for a time, typically between three and 10 minutes. This persists until it diffuses back into the blood as the levels in the blood fall due to hydrolyzation by plasma, so-called butyryl cholinesterase. Succinylcholine is unique of our neuromuscular blocking agents as being the fastest acting and that of shortest duration. The onset is between 30 and 60 seconds. The duration is around five to nine minutes. Notably, if you give sucks after a patient has received neostigmine to reverse non-depolarizing muscle relaxant, the effect of succinylcholine will be prolonged because remember these agents interfere with plasma cholinesterase. The typical dose is 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilo, since the ED95 is about 0.3 milligrams per kilo. It should be based on actual body weight. The characteristic of the block is that there is no fade and no post-titanic facilitation. We will discuss this later uh, when we come to monitoring and non-depolarizing muscle relaxation. These are the common side effects of succinylcholine. 
One is fasciculation at the onset of administration. This is common and may be quite severe, especially in younger and muscular patients. Myoplegia is common uh, in some reports up to 95%, but an average number is probably closer to 20 or 30%, and it is more common in young adults. Sinus bradycardia can be seen especially in young children, and for this reason, in this age group, they should be pretreated with atropine. Trismus can occur Again, more common in children, about 4%, but it's rarely severe. Myoglobinemia is uncommon. Increased intraocular pressure is true. It's usually mild, transient, and of doubtful significance, even with open eye injuries, but probably should be avoided in patients with glaucoma. It also increases intragastric pressure to a small amount, but is of doubtful significance. Hyperkalemia commonly occurs, but it's usually very small amount, uh, only about 0.5 to, only about a quarter to 0.5 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, we'll discuss uh, conditions in which this may be exaggerated. And finally, it can cause malignant hyperthermia. It's the most important anesthetic agent associated with malignant hyperthermia. However, it's relatively rare, except in MH susceptible patients. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, the incidence is fairly low. We don't know exactly, but these are round figures. Now, what are the indications and contraindications for sex? In my opinion, and that of a number of other of other of real experts, is it's a drug of choice for rapid sequence induction. Now, often uh, rock uranium is used, but this is much more reliable and uh, much more consistent. Uh, usually, we use somewhat higher doses, one and a half to two milligrams per kilo. Uh, uh, And I also recommend using it for intubation uh, in patients if you don't need prolonged relaxation or in whom you want to avoid prolonged uh, relaxation, such as patients who are undergoing uh, neuromuscular block, uh, blockade monitoring uh, for spinal cord surgery, etc. Uh, the main contraindication is patients who are MH susceptible. Uh, patients with a family history or known history of MH, and patients with muscular dystrophy. And secondly, in patients with severe burns or spinal cord injury. This is due to the proliferation of abnormal <coughs> receptors, which lead to a marked increase in uh, 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 potassium release. Uh, there are also a couple relative contraindications <coughs> In my opinion, one is boys under 12 years of age because they may have a delayed appearance of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and there are case reports of this. And the second is patients with chronic or acute disease and immobility, uh, again, because of the proliferation of these extra uh, 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 pyramidal uh, uh, receptors on the muscle leading to increased uh, potassium. Now, we mentioned that uh, fasciculation is a common uh, uh, associated with administration of fasciculation. And as a consequence, this is notable when you're putting patients to sleep. And secondly, it can be a cause of, of uh, the myo uh, uh, myo uh, 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 muscle uh, pain that patients experience. And therefore, uh, uh, many ways of so-called taming or reducing this have been suggested, such as these drugs. But the most common approach is the administration of a sub-paralyzing dose, uh, i.e. one-tenth of the uh, normal dose, 
uh, of a non-depolarizer muscle relaxant or even of succinylcholine uh, two to three minutes uh, prior to administering the, the uh, therapeutic dose. The problem with this is, number one, it does not always prevent fasciculation or myalgia. And secondly, and this is very important, it can cause subjective or more importantly actual uh, muscle relaxation and difficulty breathing or ability to maintain or protect the airway. And finally, remember it requires increasing the dose of succinylcholine. Another uh, unique uh, characteristic <coughs> of succinylcholine is so-called phase two block. <clears throat> this is encountered after large doses <coughs> or prolonged infusions of succinylcholine. <clears throat> the characteristic of the block now resembles that following the administration of non-depolarizing block. Namely, they exhibit fade and post-tetanic potentiation. And the implications are <clears throat> that the block is now long-lasting. <clears throat> the preferred management is time, waiting for them to spontaneously recover <clears throat> and not uh, using some kind of reversal agent. The explanation of this phenomenon <clears throat> is not fully known, but it's suspected to be a presynaptic phenomenon of the effect of <clears throat> acetylcholine uh, on uh, and uh, uh, succinylcholine on the presynaptic uh, uh, acetylcholine receptors. Uh, another uh, topic is that of atypical plasma cholinesterase. Remember that uh, the termination of succinylcholine is based on removal uh, by or hydrolysis by plasma cholinesterase. Uh, in patients with abnormal cholinesterases, they are unable to ester to hydrolyze ester bonds on uh, succinylcholine. But by the way, uh, this is also true of the non-depolarizing muscle relaxant mivacurium. There are uh, 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 three uh, dominant variants: the so-called homozygous normal. Uh, the heterozygous abnormal and the homozygous abnormal. There are actually many other variants which you'll learn about, but today we're concentrating on these major ones. The incident, uh, and on this slide I've demonstrated the incidence of these uh, hom heterozygous and homozygous and uh, uh, how they're diagnosed, which is by measuring the dibucane number, which uh, you'll study and learn about uh, beyond our presentation today. Uh, normal dibucane number, and there's a there's a typo here. Uh, it should read 70 to 80. Uh, normally, it's nor over 80. Uh, uh, with their heterozygous, it's uh, it's below 70, uh, but usually above 50. And when they're uh, homozygous, it's usually under 30. And the significance is on the duration of sucks. When your heterozygous is slightly prolonged, about twice, but when you're homozygous, it can be significantly prolonged. Um, the treatment of this, uh, of course, is to ventilate the patient uh, 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 to assure adequate ventilation and then wait until they uh, spontaneously recover. Now let's turn to the other class of blocking agents, the so-called non-depolarizing. These uh, act by attaching to the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. But unlike acetylcholine, they do not initiate depolarization. Instead, they block further activation uh, of the muscle by stimulation. This is a competitive block. That's important because it can over, be overdriven by more acetylcholine. And the duration uh, depends on the rate of the duration of the block by these non-depolarizing. depends on their rate of elimination. 
So uh, I'm going to review various aspects of these agents. Uh, the agents can be classified according to their chemical structure. There's a naturally occurring, the first one described in 1942, which was curare, sometimes called de tubo curare, and was used until the last 20 years or so. The so-called steroidals, uh, the first uh, was, uh, was pancuronium. Uh, these are synthetics uh, developed in 1967. Uh, vecuronium in about 1980 and rocuronium a little later. And the benzyl isoquinolones, uh, which are listed here. They also are classified by duration of action. Long, uh, meaning uh, 30 to 60 minutes. Intermediate, meaning around 30 minutes. And short, meaning less than 30 minutes. Uh, these are uh, the most common agents that we use nowadays. They're a large number, and the text will go into more detail. Uh, and I've provided the ED95, the usual dose, the onset, the duration, and the main organ of excretion. Now, uh, these are not fully eliminated by the liver and uh, to a various degree uh, by the kidney. Uh, Rocuronium, perhaps 25% by the, by the uh, kidney. But in general, um, they're not... Uh, uh, dependent on kidney function. Uh, Rocuronium may last a little longer with severe renal insufficiency. The other last two agents are eliminated by hydrolysis uh, inside the uh, uh, inside the uh, the uh, uh, plasma. And we already mentioned Mivacurium. This is uh, 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 requires uh, plasma cholinesterase and uh, pseudocholinesterase and in abnormal uh, pseudocholinesterase, uh, abnormal cholinesterase uh, will be prolonged. Now, uh, the good thing about the non depolarizing muscle relaxants is that they have relative, especially the modern ones, unlike D. tubo curare, which caused a lot of histamine release, uh, and some of the older agents, is that they have relatively few side effects. Uh, uh, however, uh, one of the most important is anaphylaxis. And of all the anesthetic drugs that we used, uh, uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, including sucks, are uh, the ones most commonly associated with anaphylaxis. And the incidence is somewhere around a, a tenth of a percent, perhaps a little lower. They have modest of any cardiovascular effects. Um, Pancuronium caused a little tachy mild increase in heart rate. As I said, the old agents that released histamine could cause problems. But the most important complication is residual neuromuscular blockade. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in the, in the later. And finally, uh, this is an interesting uh, point, is that the incidence of recall is about twice as common in patients who have received neuromuscular blocking agents. It's not uh, because they cause recall, but because they hide the fact that uh, the patient may be aware but is unable to communicate this with you because they're muscle relaxed. Now let's turn to reversal agents. There are two classes. One is the anticholinesterase agents, and uh, the second is the sugamidics. <clears throat> There are uh, a number of anticholinesterase agents, but the only ones that we commonly use is neostigmine. Uh, importantly, both of these require the simultaneous administration of an anti-muscarinic agent, uh, either atropine or glycopyrrolate, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, the rationale for use of anticholinergic agents is that the uh, non-depolarizing muscle relaxant do so by competitively blocking acetylcholine receptors. Thus, if one increases the amount of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft, one can overcome the effect of neuromuscular blockade. These anticholinergic agents decrease the metabolism of 
anticholinergic, by tissue anticholinesterase. They are ideally administered after much of the drug has already been metabolized and thus they hasten the process. However, they result in an increase in acetylcholine in other sites, so-called muscarinic sites. Thus, one has to administer an anti-muscarinic agent, such as atropine or glycopyrrolate, to avoid these unwanted side effects such as bradycardia, emesis, diarrhea, salivation, etc. Finally, they have important limitations. First of all, they have slow onset and very slow maximal effect. Onset is only about three minutes and maximal effect is 15 to 20 minutes. And finally, they will not reverse deep blockade. These are my recommendations for reversal with neostigmine. Based, dosing is based on neuromuscular blockade monitoring. If the count is one or less, you should delay. If the count is two to three, give Senvi mics per kilo, and I use this on uh, actual body weight or if they're morbidly obese, adjusted body weight. Although it is commonly said you should not give more than five milligrams per kilo, that's in the textbook. I'm giving you my opinion, I would give more if, if they are obese. Um, if the count is four out of four, but still have fade, then I recommend giving 40 to 50 bikes. If they have uh, four out of fade without subjective detectable fade, then I give 20. And if they have a normal objective train of four ratio of greater than 0.9, then I think you can avoid giving any. If you're going to give neostigmine, give it as early as possible because, as I said, the full effect takes perhaps up to 20 minutes. Administer it slowly in divided doses over two minutes to avoid the cardiac effects of either the uh, neostigmine or the atropine or glycopyrrolin. I use glycopyrrolate and give it simultaneously because its onset and peak effect are similar to that of, of the neuromuscular blocking agents. Others use atropine. If you use atropine, you have to give it uh, a couple minutes before. Um, uh, finally, it's critical to use objective neuromuscular monitoring to assure full reversal. I'll talk about this uh, as we come towards the conclusion. Now let's turn to Sugamidex. This is the new agent on the on the horizon. It uh, was released in about the mid 1990s. It is a unique reversal agent and works by an entirely different mechanism. It binds steroidal, steroidal non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, especially rocuronium and to a less extent vecuronium, which are in the plasma. This results in diffusion of the neuromuscular blocking agent away from the neuromuscular junction and thus reduced blockade. The Sugamidex neuromuscular blocking agent complex is then eliminated by the kidney. Reversal is quite rapid and occurs within one to three minutes. The advantage of this over neostigmine, it has faster onset and achieves more complete reversal much faster, typically in less than five minutes compared with 15 or 20 minutes with neostigmine. Secondly, it can overcome deep levels of block, 
which neostigmine cannot do. And finally, it does not require co-administration of an anti-muscarinic. It does have some limitations. It's somewhat more expensive. It may have adverse effects on hormonal birth control. The complex is eliminated by the kidney and as a consequence uh, of pro and the consequence of prolonged circulation of the complex are unknown and thus uh, caution is recommended in using it in patients with a low glomerular filtration rate. It does not reverse non-steroidal, non-neuromuscular blocking agents such as cisatricurium and mivacurium. Finally, if you have to muscle relax a patient after they've received Sugamidex, this can be complicated problematic. Either you should use a non-steroidal muscle relaxant or a higher dose of the steroidal muscle relaxant. Finally, there are rare reports of anaphylaxis, about the same as other muscle relaxants and reversal agents, and uh, occasional reports of bradycardia. My current recommendations is that it should be the drug of choice for reversal of rocuronium, but it should only be administered after first checking depth of blockade with a neuromuscular blockade monitor. Dosing should be based on objective neuromuscular blockade monitoring. If the train of four is zero and the post-tetanic count is zero, you should delay any attempt at reversal. If the train of four is less than one, or is one or less, but the post-tetanic count is greater than one to two, then give four. If the train of four count is two to four, give two. If it's four of four with fade, give one. And if there's no fade, and the train of four ratio is greater than 0.9, then you can avoid giving any reversal. And finally, I recommend using it with caution in women in childbearing age because of the adverse effect on, on hormonal contraception and in patients with a low GFR for reasons I've already discussed. Let me then turn finally to neuromuscular blockade monitoring. Well, this is not an ASA requirement. Most experts strongly recommend uh, as do many organization, anesthesia organizations. Yes? Can I bother you for a quick minute? Monitoring is recommended uh, to provide, to assess adequacy effect, to guide dosing during surgery, to guide selection and dosing a reversal agent, and to assure adequate reversal at the end of uh, to assure uh, prevention of residual muscular blockade. There are a number of monitors. One is clinical, such as movement, ventilation, bite, drip, etc. But these are very inadequate. Secondly are twitch monitors. In other words, the response of a muscle to stimulation of motor nerves. Various sites are used, such as the adductor pollicis to nerve to ulnar nerve stimulation and the levator um, uh, uh, to facial nerve stimulation. Uh, these can be assessed uh, subjectively. or quantitatively, objectively. There's a uh, typographical error here, I'm sorry. By subjective, I mean looking at movement or feeling the movement. These are considered inadequate. Uh, there are quantitative measures which we have available in our hospital. Uh, they can use mechanical assessment, 
uh, acceleration assessment or assessment of electromyography. And these are the preferred methods. There are several modes of stimulation which you should be familiar with. Um, I'm not going to go into the details today uh, on all of these. Um, single twitch, repeated twitch, train of four. The train of four is a standard monitor and uh, because uh, uh, it shows fade and uh, as the depth of, neuromus of uh, non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockade increases, the uh, strength of the progressive gets progressively weak and then you progressively lose uh, down uh, from four to three to two to none. Um, titanic uh, double burst um, is, uh, uh, there's a typo here. Uh, these should be two different sections. Sections. Uh, uh, one is a so-called double burst, which is two uh, titanic uh, twitches three quarters of a second apart and they're more sensitive to fade. Uh, and finally, there's tetanus, which is a very important. Uh, 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 tetanus is used to detect post-titanic potentiation. And uh, also uh, to uh, assess uh, the presence of post-titanic count. Um, Finally, there's a variable about uh, the amount of stimulation, and usually we use uh, supramaximal stimulation, which is usually about um, 60 to 80 uh, milliamps. Uh, before I go further, I realize I overlooked an important statement about non-depolarizing muscle relaxants and the characteristic of their block. I mentioned the characteristic of uh, the block after sectional choline, uh, but uh, the block after non-depolarizing muscle relaxants is different in that uh, it is characterized by fade and by post-titanic potentiation. Finally, a few comments about uh, adequacy of relaxation and reversal. Uh, Relaxation should be based on uh, whether the patient is able to operate. However, you must be cautious about this because often the surgeons will ask for maximal relaxation even though they don't need it. And they don't understand the side effects of too much relaxation. Normally, a train of four ratio of uh, one to two out of four is adequate for most surgery. Rarely is deeper block needed, although some surgeons believe it's necessary to be a zero out of four for laparoscopic procedures. Uh, never should it be uh, less than uh, one to two post-titanic stimulation. And finally, uh, reversal uh, is best uh, defined as twitch recovery of 90% of normal. In other words, a uh, train of four ratio of greater than 0.9. Now, this is true with mechanical uh, re uh, monitors and with my electromyographic monitors. Uh, with accelerometer monitors, which is what we use at the main OR in the, you know, at, the at our hospital, uh, it tends to read false high. And so many experts believe that if you're using accelerometry, uh, full reversal is not satisfactory until the ratio is about um, 110 or 120 percent, i.e. Uh, a ratio of uh, 1.1 or 1.2. This is a nice article I refer to you. It's titled, Keep It Safe, uh, Simple. And they suggest that we maintain patients, uh, most patients, at a moderate block with a train of four ratio of one to two, or a train of four uh, count of one to two, or uh, um, a, a modest block, which they define as a train of four ratio of three to four. Um, 
Uh, here they describe what a deep block is. Now, in closing, these are consensus statements on uh, perioperative use of neuromuscular blocking. Uh, quantitative objective monitoring should be used whenever a neuromuscular block uh, agent is administered. Subjective or clinical tests are not predictive of adequate recovery. And clinical signs such as head lift or sustained head grip, or clinical tests such as the presence of spontaneous respiration are not guarantees of complete resolution of neuromuscular blockade and no longer have a place in as a sole determinant of adequate recovery. One should be f become familiar with the function of neuromuscular blockade, the sites for monitoring, and the ways of assessing it, which I have briefly reviewed. The best site for monitoring is the ulnar nerve uh, assessing the adductor pollicis. If the train of four is zero out of four, you should check post tetanic count. And before reversal, if the train of core is zero out of four, you must check for post-Titanic count. We use the Philips uh, Neuromuster uh, uh, monitor. And uh, on this slide, I've summarized uh, how you apply that. This shows where the leads ought to be placed and the displays that are provided. The sensor should be on the volar surface of the tip of the thumb, and the stimulator should be over the ulnar nerve with the black negative more distal and the red positive uh, a few centimeters more proximal. In closing, I need to emphasize this concern about residual neuromuscular blockade. It is common in the absence of objective monitoring and adequate reversal, more than 50% of the patients. The significance is increased incidence of morbidity and mortality. Serious adverse effects are uncommon, but when adverse effects are, occur, almost always they are associated with inadequate reversal. Clinical signs and subjective neuromuscular monitoring is inadequate and you must use objective monitoring. The management is first to manage respiratory distress and secondly to reverse residual blockade. And finally the key is prevention. Minimizing use of neuromuscular blocking agents and uh, providing adequate monitoring and assessment of reversal. Thank you.